Thank you. First, I apologize for being late. I had to give a presentation to the Harborview Board of Trustees on the HIV programs here, and they had a lot of questions, and they are the Board of Trustees, so I had to stick around. <laughs> so anyway, thanks for accommodating my, my tardiness. So I think you've probably already had uh, Croy 2017 highlights, maybe Ann and Brian and maybe even Julie Dombrowski have already spoken about their topics. I was assigned HIV cure and opportunistic infections, and I'll present a few of the abstracts that I thought were notable from the meeting. So first, cure. I'll just start by saying there, there wasn't much on cure, and I'll present just one, one paper that was kind of disappointing, and it, and it references back to this study, which I presented a few years ago. This is a group in Thailand that is following people at special risk for getting HIV. They monitor them twice a week with HIV viral load, so they capture people very early, just when they got infected with HIV. And they had 19 in that cohort here that are Phi Big 1. They're RNA positive only. They don't even have a P24 yet. They don't have an antibody yet. They're very early HIV infected patients, and they look to see What's the evidence that HIV is still in their, in their body? They could find small amounts of RNA in their peripheral blood mononuclear, sorry, sorry, small amounts of DNA in their peripheral blood mononuclear cells, but when they looked for integrated DNA, when they looked in central memory, transitional and effector memory T cells, they couldn't find it. When they treated those patients for six months and then looked again, no evidence for HIV in any of their cells. So that cohort, was put on antiretroviral therapy, of course, and then after a little while, some of them volunteered to stop therapy. So there were reports on eight subjects who'd been on therapy for almost three years. Their pre-treatment interruption, they had median CD4 counts of 561 with uh, HIV DNA and inducible RNA that was undetectable. So that again, looked like no evidence for HIV in these people just before they stopped therapy. They stopped therapy, and unfortunately, all of the subjects rebounded with a median of 26 days after treatment interruption. No one had an acute retroviral syndrome, and they all, thankfully, as soon as they went back on antiretroviral therapy, they all resuppressed immediately. Some of them converted their antigen antibody tests, and there were other, some other correlates for time to a viral rebound. But the point is that even capturing people extremely early in, in their HIV infection, when you limit their reservoir to a very small reservoir, it still was not enough to cure them of HIV. And here's the graph just showing the time course for when they popped up with detectable virus afterwards. So treatment of the very early HIV infection does lead to a small reservoir size, but it was insufficient to eradicate it. So that's really the only clinical cure abstract that was at the meetings. So I'll leave it at that and switch to opportunistic infections. So there were a few interesting sessions on this for a change because OIs, I think, have gotten short shrift in previous CROI meetings. So the first is on a new mousetrap, basically, for, for diagnosing tuberculosis. Maybe mo most of us are using the gene expert to diagnose people with tuberculosis. It's quite a sensitive and specific test, but this is an improvement on that. It's called the Gene Expert Ultra. So the, the problem with Gene Expert itself is that its sensitivity is imperfect in smear negative and HIV positive cases of tuberculosis. So HIV positive patients often will come down with clinical disease when they have a lower myco mycobacterial burden. So again, that's kind of a surrogate for low mycobacterial counts. So when they made the ultra, they're, they're using it to try to capture those patients and make the diagnosis of TB in those patients who are smear negative or HIV positive and have tuberculosis. It has some new targets, two new targets. I don't know what these genes code for, but they're listed there, IS6110 and IS1081 versus the old target, which is gene RPOB. It doubles the specimen volume, so you might expect you'd have increased sensitivity if you're sampling a larger specimen. And it has some optimized chemistry that they didn't share with anybody. I think it's proprietary information. So they launched a prospective multicenter study in patients who had signs and symptoms of tuberculosis and were comparing gene expert with the ultra on the same specimen. And the, the gold standard in this study was a standard of four other cultures performed on two specimens and tamed on different days. So, so culture was the gold standard for this study. So there were 1,500, over 1,500 patients from 10 sites across eight countries. And the sensitivity of the ultra was better 
than the gene experts, so 95% versus 90%. And they picked up most of that sensitivity among smear negative cases and HIV positive cases. They lost a little bit of specificity. Those decreases were higher, especially in people that had a history of tuberculosis before. Those people were more likely to have just barely positive results. They called them trace calls. And if they got rid of those trace calls, then, this, then the specificity of the ultra was improved. So the idea here is that people that had TB before might still have some organisms in their respiratory tract that are dead, but are triggering the test as being positive. They also mentioned that data using non-pulmonary specimens looked good in the oral abstract, but they didn't give any specifics on that. And thankfully, they say that the cost of the ultra will be the same as the gene expert. So this is another advance in making the diagnosis of TB. I know we still rely on culture for so many things, but isn't it nice when you can get a diagnosis of TB quickly using an amplification test rather than waiting for the culture to turn positive? Okay, still on the theme of tuberculosis, not something that we deal with in this country very often, thankfully, but certainly worth knowing about, is the treatment of XDRTB. So XDRTB, remember, resistant to INH, resistant to rifampin, resistant to one of the injectables, and resistant to quinolones. So very difficult to treat tuberculosis. This is an ongoing study that was presented before the CROI abstracts, but it was such an important finding, they decided to present the results at CROI as well. An open-label study in South Africa looking at bedaquiline, dose Q day for two weeks and then three times a week for after that, pertominid and linazolid, all for six months. And if patients were culture positive at four months, then they could extend the therapy beyond the six months to nine months. Patients were eligible for this study if they had XDRTB, or if they had multidrug resistant tuberculosis, so just resistant to INH and rifampin alone, but were intolerant of the treatment, then they, they could be treated this way. The primary endpoint was bacteriological failure, relapse, or clinical failure six months after ending therapy. So the study is still ongoing, and they presented data that was from April 2015 through the end of December. Half the patients were HIV positive. Most had XDRTB. 20% had MDRTB. 34 had completed six months of therapy, and 20 of those 34 had met the endpoint of being six months post-treatment. 74% were culture negative at eight, eight weeks, and 100% were culture negative at four months. Four patients died, three had disseminated TB, and one a horrific death with erosive esophagitis. And uh, there were some AEs, mostly that, mostly that were chalked up to linazolid. There were 27 that were characterized as serious, but no patients withdrew from the study. Linazolid toxicities were common, neuropathy, myelosuppression. Most patients required dose interruption. A few cases of chemical hepatitis that got better after rechallenge, and no optic neuritis, which you have to fret about with linazolid. And as of December 15th, there was one patient who relapsed. So all patients who had been treated except for that one, and those patients who died very early, were cured of XDRTB, which is just crazy good. So this created quite a stir and really is fantastic for people who take care, for providers who take care of these patients. And you know, if we ever encounter them, I think we'd have to look at using this, this regimen as well. So big news on the XDRTB front. We talk about IRIS a lot at this meeting, and this was the first prospective randomized study using steroids to prevent iris from happening. So an RCT of placebo versus prednisone for TB iris. Patients were at high risk for getting TB iris because they had been on anti-TB therapy for less than a month. Their T cells were low. So those are people who are at special risk for getting TB iris. There were some exclusions that are, lift, that are listed there. 240 patients, again, low CD4 counts, viral loads that were high at almost over a quarter of a million and most had a microbiologically confirmed tuberculosis. And the punchline here, the people who got prednisone to prevent iris, it worked. So fewer of those patients had TB iris than those that got placebo. Fewer of them had to go to open label prednisone. There was no difference in deaths, hospitalizations, or AEs, or severe infections. So people that were getting a lot of steroids didn't get other OIs. And there was a trend towards fewer ART interruptions in the group that was treated with prednisone. So people at very high risk for getting TB iris, getting prednisone to prevent it, decreased the incidence by 
and there were no adverse effects. But remember, there were some exclusions. People couldn't have had KS, which can get worse with, with prednisone. Okay. This paper was on cryptococcal meningitis, an interesting paper that was presented as an oral abstract. This was a phase two RCT examining early fungicidal activity with three short course, high dose L amphotericin B schedules given for patients with cryptococcal meningitis in Tanzania and Botswana. The four regimens were a single dose of L ampho, so big dose, 10 mg per kg on day one only. And they were all given with a lot of fluconazole, 1,200 milligrams a day of fluconazole. Second was 10 mg per day on day one, and then a second dose, 5 mg per kg on day three. The third arm was three doses of L amphotericin, and the control arm was L amphotericin at a lower daily dose, 3 mg per kg, but every day for 14 days. That's the control arm. And the outcome was early fungicidal activity. And so 80 patients, low T cell count. A third of them were altered at the beginning of therapy, and this is the fungal clearance. So regardless of which dose regimen you got, there was faster clearance compared to the daily regimen. Mortality was a little tougher to judge. Overall mortality was 29%. It was also not the primary endpoint, and the low numbers here, there didn't seem to be much difference between the control arms. So very rapid fungal clearance with big doses of L. amphotericin given only once just a single dose in one of the arms, and it seemed to work very well. There were more AEs in the group that was getting daily amphotericin, so the control arm had more adverse events. So take-home points from these abstracts are that extremely early treatment of the HIV, HIV alone, unfortunately, is not enough to eradicate the reservoir. We need to do something else. Early treatment will constrain the size of the reservoir, but doesn't get rid of it. The expert MTB RIF Ultra test looks like a better test for picking up tuberculosis, enhanced sensitivity with a modest loss of specificity, but it's especially useful in people who are smear negative or HIV positive. For treating patients with XDRTB, we finally have a regimen that looks like it's highly effective, pertominid, bedaquilin, and linazolid. And if you have someone who is at extremely high risk for getting an iris syndrome, as they were in, in this study, the TB iris, that prophylaxis with prednisone reduces the risk and without any adverse effects. And then single dose, very high dose, L amphotericin at 10 mg per day when combined with fluconazole is just as effective as daily treatment with L amphotericin for cryptococcal meningitis. We'll stop right there.